This is my son. Jakey was Patterson. He is 12 years old. And they took his father. He will grow up fatherless. He has to live even after this. And I have to pray that God give me strength to raise him the best of my ability. His heart is broken. He has sleeps. He has eats. And as a mother, what am I supposed to do to help him get through this? I need a village to help me raise and be here for my son because he has no father. That was the ex-wife of Hayward Patterson at his funeral in a heartbreaking moment on Friday. He was one of the 10 people shot to death in the racially motivated massacre in Buffalo 10 days ago, a horrifying incident that made clear the deadly threat that white supremacy still poses in America today. Much of the media is starting to move on, but many people just can't. Earlier today, as the funerals continue, 72-year-old Catherine Massey was laid to rest. Her friends and family describe her as a civil rights activist. She even wrote a letter to our local paper, The Buffalo News, last year, denouncing gun violence and calling for more gun regulations. The other victims from the shooting include beloved members of the community, Roberta Drury, Margus Morris and Andrew McNeil, Aaron Salter, Geraldine Talley, Celestine Chani, Pearl Young and Ruth Whitfield. As we've pointed out on this show before, the alleged shooter in Buffalo was a subscriber to the Great Replacement Conspiracy Theory, the ludicrous racist nonsense that says black and brown people are being deliberately brought into the country to replace white Americans. This is a country in which far-right white supremacist conspiracy theories are on the rise, in which far-right white Christian nationalism is on the rise, in which Americans are now polarized and divided like never before in our lifetimes. And so we as a nation will not be able to prevent future attacks like the one in Buffalo unless we understand what led to them. One person who's been working at the core questions behind issues of faith, race and diversity is a man named Ibu Patel. As the Muslim founder of Interfaith America, he served on President Barack Obama's inaugural Faith Advisory Council and he's now out with a new book. We need to build field notes for diverse democracy. It explores the challenges of the big American experiment, a country that is home to so many people, cultures, faiths. And he writes, quote, our attempt at being a diverse democracy is not just a civic project, but also a sacred one. So how do we save this project from itself when it looks to be as fractured as it is today and threatening to millions of people who are supposed to be part of it? Ibu Patel, author of We Need to Build, joins me now. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, Ibu, before we get to your book, just on this horrific massacre in Buffalo, as a Muslim who has worked on interfaith initiatives and religious understanding, particularly post 9-11, who's had to speak on issues of Islam and extremism, I wonder, do you see a difference with how we talk about terrorism when it comes from someone who claims to be Muslim versus the terrorism we're increasingly seeing from white supremacists here in the U.S.? Well, Salam Mehdi, thank you for having me on, and thank you for saying the names of the people killed in that Buffalo massacre. We cannot forget them. We cannot yes. forget them. And I think that this is an act of terrorism, and people have been calling it so. I think that one of the things we have to remember is that ugly ideologies of the past have been defeated by more beautiful ideologies. So this is not the first time America has suffered from white Christian nationalist violence. In the 1920s, it was absolutely on the rise, and it was hurting and killing and lynching lots and lots of people. And it was during that time that a group of interfaith leaders rose up and said, America is not a Protestant nation that belongs to only white nativists. America is a Judeo-Christian country. That was the birthplace of the phrase Judeo-Christian. And right now, we need a better, more beautiful ideology, a better story to defeat this ugly story of white Christian racist nationalism. I think that story is so, called Interfaith America. So on that subject of what is threatening us and t talking about issues like white supremacy, Christian nationalism, you write in the book that your first recollection of the phrase white supremacy in particular was in a Sociology 100 course in college, quote, the images of men wearing white sheets and burning crosses came to mind. And I figured my professor was referring to ancient history. But she continued, white supremacy is the assumption that the cultural patterns associated with white people are normal 
and the patterns associated with people of color are inferior. Wait, didn't that basically describe like my entire life? You then write the theory of white supremacy helped me see my entire life in a different light. Ibu, tell us what you mean by this. We live in a time where mentioning things like white supremacy or systemic racism or even race is becoming taboo in many parts of the country. What did it mean to you to be able to learn about these things in college? So, look, this, these questions about whether we should teach about racism in schools, these are crazy questions, right? How do you teach the Constitution and skip over the three-fifths doctrine? How do you teach American history and not make reference to slavery and segregation? And let's recognize that we have made progress and that progress is inspiring and that James Baldwin called on us to achieve our country and that Frederick Douglass spoke of the greatness of American ideals and the genius of American institutions. So my sense is, let's be honest about the racism of the past and the present. It's not like it's not obvious. It is obvious. And let's not assume that nothing can be done. We inherit the, the people who have worked for progress in the past, we yes. have a responsibility to take steps forward into the future. So on the subject of faith and interfaith, I want to play a couple of recent sound bites from two um, Christian right-wing Republican conservatives. Just have a listen. Talk to me about separation of church and state. Church and state was written because the state has no business in our church. But we are the church. We're the church and we run the state. And Georgia's sovereign and we're running this state with Jesus Christ first. I'm to the place right now, if you vote Democrat, I don't even want you around this church. You can get out. You can get out, you demon. You get pissed off as you want to. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. Ibu, you run an organization called Interfaith America. How do you do interfaith work with people like that? So most people are not like that. And maybe you and I are both Muslim. And there's lots of times over the course of the past 20 years that people have put up uh, images and tape of crazy, uh, crazy Muslim extremists and kind of made the assumption that we're all like them and we're not. The extremists of all religions belong to one religion, the religion of extremism. I would, I am much more interested in painting a hopeful picture of a potluck nation where we all contribute, where the nation feasts when its diverse communities bring their contributions to the table, Ibu, and saying the vast I, majority of Christians are not like that. I, I agree. The vast majority of Christians are not like that. But I also wonder, you say you want to paint a picture, a hopeful picture. What if that picture is a fictional picture with the greatest respect because we live in a country where, yes, the vast majority of Christians are not like that. Agreed. Just like the vast majority of Muslims are not extremists. But the people I just put up on screen, that guy has millions of people watching his sermons, Greg Locke. That woman is running for office. Okay, she won't win her office, but a lot of Republican Senate candidates, we just saw Doug Mastriano, basically a Christian nationalist, win the Republican gubernatorial nomination in Pennsylvania. This is now the mainstream. It's not the mainstream of Christianity in America. I agree with you. But it is the mainstream of one of our two political parties. So uh, on the one hand, you're right. Let's not tar everyone with the same brush, just as we Muslims don't want to be tarred in that way. On the other hand, we can't close our eyes to this, Ibu. This is a major, oh. major faction within American public life. Maybe I'm not closing my eyes to this. You're not closing your eyes to this, right? This, this exists and it's ugly. And we are taught in our faith Islam and other people are taught in their faiths that Beauty defeats ugliness, and it is our responsibility to bring that sense of hope and optimism. And part of what I mean by this is what we learn from the great social change figures of previous eras. Nelson Mandela, who said, I have to live with the people that I defeat, and there is nothing that I gain from further humiliating them. My job is to show them what they could be so that we can be the nation that we are meant to be. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. did. His great genius was the, was the realization that you have to live with the people that you defeat. And in fact, this is the prophet in Medina. This is the prophet at Hudaybiyah. It is the sense of you expand the group of people who feel like so they belong because we all have to live with them. It's an optimistic, it's an ambitious, it's a noble project. And the book is fascinating. I urge people to read the book. 
but I'm going to do one last pushback. We're out of, almost out of time. You say in the book, you talk about anger, righteous anger, the idea of burning down oppressive structures. You say it wasn't a role you wanted to play. You write, anger doesn't construct, it only destroys, burns everything, including those who breathe the fire, however justified and righteous in the first place. I would push back and say, if you look at the racial justice movement in America that followed George Floyd's death, led by Black Lives Matter and other groups, that was fueled by righteous anger. Anger can play a positive role, can it not? Absolutely. But the goal of social change, maybe, is not a more ferocious revolution. The goal of social change is a more beautiful social order. We need to have lots and Agreed. lots of builders of a more beautiful social order. And I take my lead from the prophet and his hedra to Medina. When he goes to Medina, he builds a constitution that recognizes yes. the diversity of all of the groups. He builds a community center called the Masjid. He builds a market where people could bring their contributions to all. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be architects of a more beautiful social order. We need to defeat the things we do not love by building the things we do.